all right good morning uh, to all of you who are here uh, pastor john could you pray for us uh, if you can open with prayer then we will uh, get started sure let's pray Father, we want to thank you for this time. Thank you for bringing us together in your presence. As we are beginning our class today, we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us. Let your voice be heard in our ears and help us to follow you. Help us to understand, comprehend, and to apply all the things that we learned today, God. We submit this time of learning into your mighty hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, um... We had a long break because last Wednesday we could not have our class. Uh, but before that, we were able to finish the Gospel of John. So now we will be getting into the three epistles of John. So today we would be covering uh, the first two chapters of the first epistle. So first John, the first two chapters is what we would look at. Now, um, if last week had not been a mandatory garment holiday, uh, we could have had a proper introduction to the epistles and you know looked at a lot of details. Now that was not possible. Um, so uh, I'll just give a very brief introduction to the epistles and we will get into the first chapter of First John. Um, you know, just to talk about authorship, um, when we were looking at the Gospel of John, the reason that we were able to uh, conclude that John the disciple was the author is because of what those early church historians recorded. There were people like uh, Irenaeus and others who uh, acknowledged and said that this gospel uh, was written by the disciple of Jesus. So based on that, uh, we were able to conclude that the gospel of John was written by the disciple John. Um, now, when it comes to these epistles, again, uh, John does not mention himself by name. If you were to look at this first epistle of John, you know, which we would be uh, studying today, uh, there are no words of introduction at all. Uh, he, I mean, the writer does not introduce himself and say, I, John, you know, would like to present these details to you or nothing of the kind. There's no greetings, uh, nothing. Uh, and then when you look at the second and the third uh, letters, again, over there, uh, uh, the writer just addresses himself as the elder. He doesn't say uh, which elder. He doesn't give his name. Uh, so again, we depend on Irenaeus and all these other um, ancient church uh, historians to give us that detail. So uh, Irenaeus of Lyons, uh, he says that first and second letters uh, were written by uh, John the disciple. Um, uh, similarly, you have uh, Eusebius. Uh, he says that uh, the second and third letters are written by John the disciple. So based on this, uh, we assume that the elder who is being mentioned in the second and third epistles of John must be John the disciple himself. Uh, now, of course, he would have been um, a little older, you know, when writing these epistles because these were written uh, after the gospel, after the gospel of John uh, was uh, written. Um, now, the main goal in uh, writing these epistles is to uh, correct the wrong teachings that are beginning to come into the young, early church. Um, if you see in the Gospel of John, there John's main concern was uh, the persecution which the new believers are facing. And he wanted to assure them that Jesus is the living God. He is the Son of God, the promised Messiah. And therefore, in spite of the persecution which the believers are facing at the hands of the Jewish leaders, they must remain strong. So he writes to urge the new believers to stay strong, to, um, uh, to affirm to them that this Jesus is indeed the divine son of God. And uh, so he wants to urge them 
to remain firm in the faith, even if it means being removed from the synagogues, even if it means you know social ostracization. Uh, so those were the main uh, things on his heart when he was writing the Gospel of John. Here, when we come to the epistles, now the church has taken shape to an extent. Um, now you have a larger group of people, you know, who are now gathering um, in uh, different house churches. So the church is kind of established. Um, the Christians have gained some uh, level of social recognition. Um, they do have some level of status now in society. So things are not as bad as it was for those early believers who faced um, uh, great persecution at the hands of their you know, Jewish relatives and families and leaders and all of that. So things have now stabilized a bit. And now into this more or less stable atmosphere, you have uh, the wolves creeping in. You know, um, the wolves who, who are pretending to be sheep are bringing in wrong doctrines. And now um, uh, Satan is using a new strategy of trying to uh, destroy this early church which is taking shape. Uh, so now it becomes very important for John and the other writers uh, to warn the, uh, the believers of the dangers which lie uh, and to keep them you know, on the straight path uh, to reaffirm again and again the correct doctrine which was taught when they first shared the gospel uh, to these believers so that these believers are not led astray. So that is why we see a difference between the introduction, um, you know, that uh, John gives in the Gospel of John and the introduction that he gives over here in the first epistle of John. If you remember when we did uh, the Gospel of John and we all, in fact, know the first verse by heart, you know, in uh, maybe we could if we could have someone read out the first three verses of the Gospel of John, we will compare that with the introduction that we see here. Uh, so if we could start with Gospel of John, uh, uh, the first chapter, if we could please have someone read out the first three verses. Yeah. John 1, 1 to 3. Uh, yeah, so uh, if you are uh, logged in and, um, uh, you know, please, if you could have your Bible with you and if you could open it uh, to the, you know, um, Gospel of John and read out the first three verses. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. So here, the main concern of John was to establish that this Jesus who is being presented to the readers as the Messiah, he is not just somebody who was born the other day. This was Jesus who was the Word, who was with God in the very beginning. And he was not just the Word who was with God. He was God. So his divinity and his eternal nature are established right at the beginning of the Gospel of John. And, uh, you know, John uh, assures his readers and tells them he was with God in the beginning. And in fact, through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So um, John establishes the fact that this Jesus, he is an eternal Messiah. And, uh, and he urges his readers to place their faith in this Jesus in spite of the persecution that they are facing. Now here in 1 John, the emphasis is on sticking on, holding on to the correct teaching, the correct doctrine. So now let's look at the introduction that is given over here in 1 John. So uh, if we could have someone read out 1 John uh, chapter 1, the first four verses, 1 to 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, 
which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard we declare to you. And you may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. Amen. So here, um, the emphasis is on holding on to the correct teaching that was uh, that has been taught uh, at the time of the you know when the, when the people accepted uh, Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior so the emphasis over here is on the word of life uh, the teaching the teaching of life which has been given only thing this teaching is not just words this teaching is actually a person you know so um, in the Gospel of John you had uh, Jesus being presented as uh, the word in the sense he is the word that created everything. And therefore, uh, the believers must place their faith in him. Here in 1 John, the emphasis is on the word of life as in the teachings uh, of Jesus. So these are not just being teachings being given by Jesus. He himself is the word of life. So um here this gospel which has been presented is a living breathing gospel in the sense they touched this word of life they walked with him they spoke to him they interacted with him uh, so the word of life over here is presented as a teaching but also as the person who embodies these teachings because even when Jesus was walking on the earth with these disciples, he didn't just simply uh, teach them a set of principles. He literally lived out those principles in the way he interacted with them, uh, you know, in, in the kind of uh, uh, values that he presented, uh, in the uh, actions and steps that he took, you know, the way he served, the way he healed, the way he delivered, all these things were declaring in action what the good news is, what the gospel is. So he literally was the gospel in action. Um, yeah, so the gospel was not just a philosophy that was being taught. The gospel was something which was literally being lived out. You know, and these disciples who were walking with Jesus, they literally touched this gospel. They heard him. They, uh, they, they, they felt his compassion. Uh, so uh, in um, John, in the Gospel of John, the emphasis is on uh, who Jesus is. And here in First John, the emphasis on who the Word is. Okay, so in John's Gospel, we looked at who Jesus is, that he is divine, that he is the Messiah, that he is the one who has been sent by the Father. Here, the emphasis is on who the Word is. The Word is uh, not just a bunch of teachings. He is literally a person who is living out everything that he proclaimed and declared. Uh, so in that sense, uh, the gospel that we are sharing today also needs to be embodied in us, the followers of Jesus. The same way Jesus didn't just simply teach, but he literally lived and acted out what he was saying. We too are expected as followers of Jesus today to literally embody uh, and act out what we are declaring. So it is not enough to simply uh, talk about the love of Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. In our lives, in our actions, we need to actually live out that love. Uh, we need to show people that this is what the love of Christ feels like. This is what it looks like in action. Um, so just as Jesus embodied the word and uh, lived it out, we too are expected today to embody this gospel message and uh, reveal it in action to people. You know, an example that just comes to my mind um, is probably about six months ago that I was having a conversation with someone. And uh, she was talking about how uh, when she uh, moved into a new MNC, uh, you know, and began to work over there. Um, people kind of looked down upon her uh, because 
her background was not from a you know, just not from a very economically strong background and they kind of looked down upon her and uh, so she's uh, talked about how one person used to speak to her very mockingly in a very condescending manner and uh, she just lived out her christian faith in that office you know uh, lived the way christ would uh, live uh, and gradually about after a year you know she uh, says re regarding this particular person who used to speak to her in a mocking way he began to treat her with respect in fact when he had any uh, prayer request you know uh, regarding his family and the situations that he was going through he would come to her and say you know uh, please you know could you you know um, pray for my family for what we are going through right now so he began to respect her and in fact when she was leaving the organization you know he uh, he he came to her and he said uh, you know i'm i'm so uh, sorry that you are leaving but i'll always remember uh, the stand that you took and the things that you shared i will always remember that now we do not know whether he uh, you know has accepted the lord or not after that but she didn't just simply share the gospel in words she lived it out and that is what made an impression upon this particular person you know in that office so like jesus it is not enough um, uh, for us to simply uh, share the teaching we need to live it out we need to present it in the way we interact in the values that we have in the stand that we take regarding um, you know important things all that shows that this is what we believe in and this is who our lord and master is and he is the only one who can save and give us eternal life so it literally shows the people in action who is the living god who is the who can be their savior who is the only person who can lead them to the father and make it possible for them to enter into heaven um uh, so in first john 1 the emphasis is on the on who the word is the word is a person and the word literally shows us uh, what god is like and what god values as um, you know uh, as as correct and righteous and uh, it it leads us to um, you know to walk along the right path uh, now in verse 2 uh, this is what uh, john continues to say regarding this word he says the life appeared we have seen it and testified to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the father and has appeared to us so this eternal life again is not a philosophy you know the greeks were coming up with all these philosophies and um uh, you know ideologies so eternal life is not a philosophy it's not an ideology it is a person who actually lived with the father now this is a concept that we are already familiar with because we looked at it earlier in john chapter 17 verse 3 when you know jesus gives his definition of eternal life and he says what is eternal life eternal life is to not, uh, you know he's he's say, he's is doing his intercessory prayer over there and this is what he says uh, to the father this is eternal life that they know you the only true god and jesus christ whom you have sent so eternal life is not an ideology eternal life is a person it, it it literally is god the father and jesus christ uh, so eternal life is the relationship which we have with this uh, person uh, you know the, the this uh, this divine person who is literally eternal life so here the same thing is being presented to us uh, where john says to his readers we proclaim to you the eternal life we are not proclaim to you an idol ideology we are proclaim to you this literal word of life who actually used to live with the father and who has now appeared to us so now when he appeared to us we got to touch him we got to see him uh, we got to listen to him and now we are passing on those things to you you know so um even as the young church is being attracted away by all these fancy new teachings which are coming up um john wants to draw them back to the living word the word who is not just a teaching but who literally is a person and a person who has been with god which means that he has access to the father and he can actually take the people who place their faith in him to the father to heaven uh so 
John is establishing right here in this preface that you need to maintain, continue to have a fellowship with this uh, word of life. And so, which is why, you know, in um, verses three and four, he goes on to say, we are, you know, I'm, I'm writing this epistle to you. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the father and with his son. Because if these believers are going to now go after those new teachings which are coming in, they would be having fellowship with those people, the ones who are uh, preaching false doctrines. Their fellowship would be with those people and with those people alone. Because you see, those people are not in a relationship with the father and with the son. On the other hand, John says, if you stick with the true church, if you stick with us, you will not only be having fellowship with us, because you're having fellowship with us, you'll automatically be having fellowship with the father and with the son as well. Um, you know, and then your joy will be complete. So um, he establishes this fact right in the preface. So the first four verses uh, are what we call the preface. Uh, if you remember in uh, the Gospel of John, uh, that first section was called the prologue. I mean, that's just terms which the you know commentaries use. So that is called the prologue. Here, the first four verses are called the preface to the rest of the uh, letter. Um, so um, just to look at a few more aspects that we observe in these verses three and four. Um, in uh, verse three, when John is declaring that our fellowship is with the father and with his son, the word that he uses over here for the son is a Greek word, huios, H-U-I-O-S. All right. Um, now, this is something which John is very careful to do in the Gospel of John and also here in the epistles. Whenever he's talking about the Son of God, Jesus Christ, he is very careful to always use this particular Greek word, H-U-I-O-S, no, Vios. On the other hand, when he's talking about the sons of God, as in the believers, the children of God, uh, you know, uh, over there, he uses a different word, technon, uh, T-E-K-N-O-N. Now, John does this almost throughout the Gospel of John and these epistles, where he uses one particular word for the Son uh, of God, Jesus, and a different word for the sons of God, the believers. Uh, probably because uh, he is catering to believers who may be led away into wrong doctrines. So he is maybe concerned that, uh, you know, uh, if, if uh, these believers are being referred to as sons of God, then they would start uh, you know, attaching divinity to themselves and going into all kinds of wrong doctrines. So John is very, very careful to observe this distinction. Um, he always refers to the, the son, Jesus Christ, as weos. And he refers to the other believers, the sons of God, as uh, technon. On the other hand, we don't see Paul doing that. So you know, in, in no way are we to think that this word weos is in some way superior to the word technon. Both of them are referring to sons. Both of them are referring to children. The term can be used uh, you know, uh, as synonyms. Uh, so one word is not superior to the other, which is what Paul does. So uh, the assumption is that maybe John used this distinction just to prevent any false doctrines coming in, where believers start saying, oh, we are sons of God, we are divine, or you know, go into any such wrong doctrines. Because if you look in Romans 8, 14, and in a whole bunch of other places where Paul is writing, he very um, freely uses this word, weos, even for the believers. Uh, so Romans 8, 14 specifically, it says those who are led by the Spirit are the weos of God. They are the children of God. So weos is in no way a superior, more divine word or anything like that. Uh, it's just that um, John likes to maintain this distinction in his gospel and his uh, epistles. Um, now, coming to another aspect, um, 
very specifically in verse 3 john says you know we are proclaiming these truths to you about this uh, word of life this embodiment of the gospel the reason that we are proclaiming this is so that you may have fellowship with us he says um because uh, if these believers were to fellowship with the other people the other section the ones who are you know preaching wrong doctrines it's not just a matter of holding on to wrong um holding on to an alternate belief it will lead to a whole bunch of other things because when you say fellowship you're not just thinking about thought patterns it literally affects your very perspective of life it literally affects the choices that you would be making tomorrow it literally affects uh, you know the the way you approach people and the way you uh, treat them uh, the way you prioritize wealth and money and status it affects everything your entire world view gets affected so he is saying if you're fellowshipping with us you're going to be doing the things which please the father and the son so you will be you know in fellowship with the father and the son your perspective of life your world view will be in line with the living god uh, so you know in that way you will be moving in the right direction on the other hand this fellowship with the world uh, would be a highly dangerous thing um, you know no, okay not fellowship with the world but fellowship with the ones who are teaching wrong doctrines fellowship with them would be very dangerous because then your entire perspective will, will start going in a different direction then why then you'll start making choices which are based on that wrong perspective and then uh, uh, your priorities would change uh, you would maybe start becoming more worldly you would no, no longer be sensitive regarding sin so all of those things could happen and so uh, he urges the believers to stay stay in true fellowship with the true believers and thereby stay in fellowship with the father and with the uh, son okay so um, just to very briefly touch upon the main um, dangers which these uh, young with this with the, which this young church was facing um there are three main uh, wrong doctrines which are talked about you know you might have heard about this uh, this term the gnostics you know g n o s t i c s uh, this uh, they talk about gnosticism which was creeping into the early church and uh, you know commentaries talk about how john was main very very concerned about this uh, so that word no, gnosticism you know uh, and the people who follow gnosticism are called the gnostics um, the g is silent so you know even though it, the word is g n o s i s um, maybe we don't pronounce the g that word gnosis uh, g n o s i s basically means knowledge that's just your greek word for knowledge and different kinds of gnosticism started to creep in so there were mainly three types of gnosticism uh, which uh were mainly prevalent at that time which could threaten the church the first type of gnostics were uh somebody called the docetists d o c e t i s t s docetists docetism you know was one uh, belief system now these are people who said that jesus was not really fully human he appeared to be human but actually he was not completely normal uh, you know a normal ordinary human like others rather they say he was like the angel of the lord of the old testament you know he would appear in human form to people but he would not actually be human the way you know we are human you know we uh, uh, we have our human limitations you know we can't fly in the air uh, you know uh, we we can't go without food and water so i mean uh, so what these docetists were saying is that yes jesus appeared human but he was not uh, fully human the way we are human he just uh, he was more like an angel who took on the appearance of uh, of a human uh, but was not limited in the way humans are the second category of wrong teaching that was coming in was was something called the serinthian serinthianism C E R I N T H I A N I S M. 
So the Serinthians were people who went to the other extreme. While the Docetists were saying that, you know, Jesus was not fully human, um, the Serinthians, on the other hand, were of the belief that Jesus was totally and fully human with no divinity. So what they believed was that Jesus was born as a normal human being uh, to Mary and Joseph. He, he had human parents. Both his father and mother were human. So he was biologically born as a human. But at the time of baptism, the spirit of Christ descended upon him and took possession of him. So he temporarily became divine. And then when he was hanging on the cross, the spirit of Christ left him and went away and he came back to his human state. He again became just merely human. So they, on the other hand, these Serinthians are attacking the very um, work of, of uh, or, or, you know, the, the work of atonement which Jesus did on the cross. Because if it's just a human being who was hanging on that cross, he would be human just like us. He would just be sinful like us. How on earth can a sinful human being atone for our sins? You know, they're literally taking away the very core of the gospel by, uh, you know, promoting this wrong doctrine. So they say that on the cross, when Jesus was uh, hanging over there, the spirit of Christ leaves him and he comes back to his normal human state. So it is a human who died on that cross. It is a human who paid the price, which actually has no, um, you know, which just takes away the entire uh, uh, gospel message altogether. And then you had this other, uh, um, what we call as the Gnostics proper, uh, the ones who um, believed in all this secret knowledge and all of that. So these Gnostics, uh, they believed that not everyone is, um, you know, uh, chosen by God. There are some to whom he comes and he gives them the special secret mystic knowledge. It's a special gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. It's a special secret mystic knowledge which he imparts to certain Christians. They are the chosen ones. All the other believers are not really true believers, is what they say. The problem with all these three types of Gnostics is that they were influenced by the Greeks who believed that matter is impure. You know, uh, ma all matter is impure. So if something has to be pure, it has to be in a spirit form. Anything that is, uh, that, that is flesh or matter is automatically impure. And only what is spirit, what is, um, you know, uh, abstract, only that can be pure. So that was the Greek belief system. And these Gnostics were influenced by that. So why were the Docetists saying, oh, no, Jesus was not fully human? Because uh, that would mean that Jesus actually had a human body like all of us. And according to them, the human flesh is impure. But actually, the truth is that the human flesh is neutral. I mean, it's just the carrier, you know, the container in, in which we live. Um, uh, you know, Paul, he when he uses that word S-A-R-X, uses, uses it in his uh, epistles in three different senses he's talking about the container the you know the, the fleshly container inside which we all live that's that's neutral it's neither um, sinful or bad in any way it's just matter it's just material and then he uses uh, uh, that word sarx in the sense of sinful nature now that is corrupt so whenever he uses, uses the word flesh in that sense then he's referring to the sinful nature and not just the human container made up of flesh. Uh, so uh, these people, these Gnostics, they went to the extreme of believing that just the, 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 the normal human flesh is automatically impure. So how can Jesus be completely human? So which means, oh, no, no, no. Maybe he just simply assumed the shape of a human, but he was not fully human. Is you know, is what the Docetists were saying. In the same way, the Serinthians, they were, um, they could not accept the fact that, uh, that uh, a, a person of flesh can actually be divine. So they came up with a theory, no, 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 the, uh, the spirit of Christ must have descended upon him and take possession of him for a little while. During that time, he was kind of divine, even though he was living in a fleshly body. Uh, but temporarily because of the spirit of Christ which came into him, he became divine temporarily, is what they said. In the same with the Gnostics, 
they completely rejected all ideas of uh, you know uh, jesus being um, of coming in the flesh and they said uh, uh, you know uh, he, jesus was just a divine being and he imparts secret mystic superior knowledge to some chosen few and only they will make it into heaven uh, so these were all doctrines which were denying the fact that jesus came in the flesh was born as a human that he lived as a human was thirsty was hungry uh, was uh, you know walked about uh, the uh, and you know was uh, allowed people to touch him to interact with him uh, they deny the the aspect of jesus literally being in the flesh among us and so they deny the fact that he literally died the way humans you know uh, human flesh dies so they don't believe in an actual death and an actual burial they're denying those facts and so because they're denying all of that they're also automatically denying the resurrection where jesus now is resurrected from the dead and he assumes a resurrected body they are denying all of this so basically they're just denying the power of the gospel altogether because the power of the gospel rests in this that he became fully human human flesh he became like us to be our representative and as our representative in the flesh he hung on that cross and took our sins upon him he paid the atonement for us and having paid the price he died and then because sin could have no control over him he rose up victorious and he assumed a resurrected body for all of this you need to accept the fact that jesus came in the flesh it it's like very vital it's it's central to the entire gospel message and these wrong doctrines were trying to take away this important vital truth so which is why um john uh, it wishes to emphasize these uh, you know uh, facts so he 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 tries to appeal to these believers he tries to say to them you know take a look at those people uh, look at their attitude to um, yeah, you know uh, to to the to the to the different things which we believe in their attitude to sin their attitude to fellowship with believers their attitude towards uh, god himself you know test their attitudes and next he says test their actions their obedience are they living in obedience so he he puts forward these two tests and he says by using these two tests you can determine whether these people are really true followers of jesus or not so in first uh, john chapter 1 verse 5 onwards all the way up to chapter 2 verse 2 he talks about these different attitudes which a true believer will have anyone who does not have this uh, uh you know true attitudes is actually a fake christian he is not a real christian so in first john chapter 1 verse 5 all the way up to 2 2 he is you know putting forward this test um uh, whereby you can uh, uh, assess whether a person is a genuine believer or not he says test their attitude towards sin test their attitude towards other believers test their different attitudes and then uh, in the in the next portion he says uh, test and see what their actions are like are they living in obedience or are they not living in obedience all right so we, let's look at the first uh, portion um so if we can have someone read out for us um uh, verses 5 um up to verse 7 yeah first john chapter 1 Verses five to seven, please. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son. cleanses us from all sin yeah um many things over here to be looked at um he um uh, he says uh 
in verse 6 yes in verse 6 if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness we lie and do not live out the truth so you can't live in dark you cannot walk in darkness you cannot walk in sin and continue to say that you have fellowship with the living god which is what these uh, you know uh, we, uh, the followers of the wrong doctrine were doing they were claiming to have fellowship with the living god but they were walking in darkness they were walking in sin moreover and another thing which they were doing is that um, without walking in the light they were claiming to have fellowship with believers okay so uh, verse 7 john says if we walk in the light as he is in the light then we have fellowship with one another but these people they don't want to have fellowship with us they are saying that they are superior they have access to some secret knowledge they say that they have revelations which are not give, which have not been given to the uh, you know ordinary believer and so they do not wish to have fellowship with the rest of the true church they are separating themselves as some kind of exclusivist group who are superior to the rest so they are claiming to walk in the light but they are not living in fellowship with the others so that itself proves that they are actually not walking in the light because if they were walking in the light as he is in the light then they would be willing to have fellowship with um, you know the body of christ uh, so another thing that comes out over here it talks about how the blood of jesus um, purifies us from all sin if we are truly genuinely walking in the light anyone walking in the light they will on a very on, on a daily basis undergo a sanctification process they will not just continue living in sin and feel no guilt and uh, you know um, um, and, and not even feel convicted so genuine believers are ones who will on a daily basis keep getting sanctified because of the blood of jesus um now um let's actually yeah i think i mean these are important facts all right so let's take the time to look at this i mean we are kind of you know running out of time but it's so important that we need to uh, grasp these things uh, so um a person who is genuinely walking in the light he will be getting sanctified on a daily basis uh, he will be getting purified from all sin on a daily basis because the lord is making him the, the god the father is working in his life to make to confirm him to the image of jesus christ okay so that's happening on a daily basis uh, the word walk you know walking in the light and that word purify purifies us from all sin both of them are in a, in the present tense present continuous so the person who is walking is also getting purified on a daily basis it's it's a it's a continuous process that is taking place every day and it is happening through the blood of jesus now over here that word blood of jesus literally means the finished work of the cross in the new testament in most of the places where it talks about the blood of jesus it's not uh, talking about uh, the that literal liquid blood uh, it is talking about the finished work of the cross you know it's like a shorthand phrase instead of you know giving that long lengthy sentence saying you know the uh, on the cross he hung for us and was crucified and he took our uh, sins upon himself and then you know having made the atonement he was raised from the dead uh, so um, instead of saying that entire thing they will just use a small term blood of jesus the blood of jesus basically is talking about the entire process that jesus went through for our atonement it represents that entire finished work of the cross for instance if you when you, when you look in revelation chapter 12 you know verses um 10 to 12 uh, especially verse 11 revelation chapter 12 verse 11 where it says they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony so that word over there blood of the lamb it's talking about that entire crucifixion process that jesus went through that atonement that work of atonement which he did on our behalf so there it's not just talking about the liquid blood it's actually talking about the entire work of 
uh, atonement which Jesus did on the cross for us. So how did these believers triumph? They triumphed over him by this finished work of the cross which the Lamb did for them. And they testified to it. With, they opened their mouth and they testified and said, yes, this is what Jesus did for us on the cross. And therefore, these are the choices which we are going to make. And this is how we are going to follow him. So um, this term, blood of Jesus, refers to the entire work of that was done on the cross by Jesus for us. Okay, so um, the thing is, I mean, we have believers who kind of use this term blood of Jesus in a very um, superficial manner. They say, you know, okay, I'm going to apply the blood of Jesus to my house. I'm going to apply the blood of Jesus to my car. I'm going to apply the blood of Jesus to my children. Um, it also, it almost makes it like one of those pagan rituals which people do. You know, they talk about um, holy water and then they go around, go around sprinkling that holy water on uh, different objects. And their assumption is that if they sprinkle that holy water on different objects, somehow that object gets protected and preserved. The blood of Jesus is not like that. It's not some kind of a talisman. It's not some kind of a um, magic substance that will um, you know, make things right. Now, a young believer who has not yet learned the teachings of the you know, uh, Bible very well, if they are doing that, it's all right. I mean, the Lord who is looking at them looks at the faith in their heart and the Lord says, see, in their own way, this person, you know, they're, they're trusting me. They're placing their faith in what I did on the cross. Uh, so it's acceptable. It's fine. But I think as we continue to grow in the Lord, we need to understand that this blood of uh, Jesus is not like some kind of a holy water. It's the entire it's, it's what Jesus did on the cross for us. It's that finished work. You know, it, it, it talks about so many, the blood of Jesus, that finished work of the cross is actually the victory which we now have over sin. We no longer have to live as slaves of sin. It, it represents the healing which we now have. It represents the status which we now possess where we are seated in the heavenlies with Christ. This blood of, uh, this finished work of Christ, it represents the spiritual uh, inheritance which is now ours. That is what this blood of Jesus represents. So if you just simply say, oh, I'm going to apply the blood of Jesus to my children, at a very basic level, if, if you're a very young believer, the Lord maybe you know will just accept it you know, at face value and protect you. But as you grow in the Lord, you need to understand that what you're actually saying is the finished work of the cross. I'm applying that to my children. Therefore, I'm going to claim that they will know, you know, how no harm will come to them. If they fall ill, I will claim what Jesus did on the cross and I will see to it that they receive their healing. So you, you speak the finished work of the cross, the new status that they have in Christ, the covenant in which they are now part of, you know, your, your children are part of because of the faith which they have placed in Christ. You don't just simply say, oh, I'm applying the blood of Jesus. It's not like some holy water which has, you know, uh, somehow shielded them. So because these believers in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, how did they triumph? They didn't just go around, you know, applying the blood of the lamb here and there. They understood what that blood of the lamb represented, the finished work which it represented. And with their, with their mouth, they testified about it and they claimed it. And because they did it, then the evil one could have no hold over them because they have understood what the blood of the lamb represents and they are claiming it by the word of their testimony and the evil one has no longer any hold over them. That is how victory comes. It doesn't come to just by using the blood of Jesus like a holy water. That would be a very superficial level of um, belief, you know. So um, when we talk about the blood of the lamb, we understand that it's a, it's something which is, which is sanctifying us on a daily basis. It is something which is enabling us to uh, have a, a deeper walk with God, enjoy the spiritual inheritance that we are meant to have. It is something, this, this finished work of the cross, it is something which enables us to no longer live as helpless slaves of sin, but to live in victory. So um, we need to understand this term blood of Jesus in this greater sense, you know, it's a shorthand term which the um, New Testament writers used to represent the entire finished work of the cross which Jesus has done on our uh, behalf.
yeah, that's just something that I wanted to get across uh, to all of us. So we, when we come back from the break, you know, we'll continue. Uh, so yeah, thank you.